Yeah, hi everybody. This uh, welcome to the um, Eastern Himalayan Nationomic Forum. Uh, this is our eighth version and is being held between the first and fifth uh, of uh, December. Uh, today is the first of December, and uh, really it's the inaugural session. And we have no less than uh, Mr. Sham Saran, who's personally a person I've admired for a long time. The first time I met him was in Bombay, and then after. I didn't uh, sort of let him go. I continued to trouble him and try and download a lot of his knowledge and his wisdom. I think uh, Sham is a for, for, uh, former foreign secretary and he basically served <clears throat> in the prime minister's envoy for nuclear affairs and climate change and chairman of the National Security Advisory Board. He was also chairman of uh, research and information systems of developing countries He's currently a member of the governing body of the Center for Research, Life Trustee of the India International Center, a trustee of World Wildlife uh, Fund India, a member of the National Executive of FIKI, and an independent director of the Press Trust of India. But I suppose that really stacks up in favor of our subject today, which is ecology is economy. And uh, this is really mostly on the geographic side. And really, if you look at the value chain of what we've been developed over the last few years at Balibara Foundation, we find that most people who are doing what they call con uh, uh, sort of conservation are not really engaging in a conversation which is involving and actually measuring the people impact of what really they're doing. And a lot of it has actually been fun and a lot of it is because people like nature, which is a good thing, but a lot of it is not actually put into any kind of uh, manualized version the way economics is and therefore we chose the subject ecology is economics and I didn't want to debate it it so doesn't sound uh, fully appropriate as somebody told me to say ecology is economy is not right English maybe it's not right English but definitely all we're talking about is that unless we actually talk ecology seriously and say that economy is really something which is nothing but a byproduct of uh, ecology so you cannot have economics. Economics is a 100% owned subsidiary of ecology. So I have no idea why people even go around talking about this. More than Sham's uh, qualifications, which are linked very much with geography, politics, and uh, uh, what do you call economics, I think it is important to understand that Sham has a head, heart, and hand mm -hmm. for uh, the entire process of leadership of climate change. And like everything in uh, the world, it goes through its ups and downs in terms of how hot the subject is on ecology. I think it seems that uh, with the recent uh, conversation that our Prime Minister has had, uh, climate change, if not ecology, is back at the center of the discussions other than other challenges. In terms of the value chain, I think it's fantastic that Boris Johnson has announced and it's uh, really front page news that economy is going to be linked with ecology and ecology is going to lead everything. So coming to the value chain, we believe that the value chain of ecology starts with geology and that's really the formation of the world. And then we believe that from there it moves on to anthropology is the movement and social dimensioning of people and how they use the uh, geology. And then it moves on uh, to what I would call geography and then the geographical definition of what there is. And then we talked about zoology, botany, uh, elements which are all linked with zoology, with zoology and uh, botany. But it, in fact, is linked very much with what we call uh, the post-industrial uh, revolution or during the industrial revolution definition of the world on how well you're doing. And how well you're doing seems to have actually zeroed in on economics. We at Balipara Foundation have been actually trying to change that narrative to say that it is actually a little more than that and actually economy is less than that because there's a social and ecological dimension to it. Meaning we developed an acronym and we in fact in, in jest and sometimes very childishly call it C-S-E-E. -S -E -E. So it's social, economic and ecological. <coughs> so if we don't have that, and you don't dimension it along with the value chain starting understanding the geology of it, we will actually get carried away in terms of the redefinition. Rewilding is therefore the new focus and that rewilding is linked with the formation of 
nature capital. Just as much as you talk about fixed deposits or mutual fund, we believe that rewinding is the new form of assets. And this new form of asset is really linked completely and totally with uh, ecology and its dimension of measuring ecology. Because if you don't create nature capital, you don't have natural assets. And if you don't have natural assets, there's no question of actually funding the projects that we have, because still till now, the legal tender is cash. But having done cash, if your outcome at every level, whether it's organization or government, is that it is uh, measured by social, economic, and ecology, I think we have a whole new world that we need to look at. And it is so important that people like Sham actually lend to this subject and actually give us your wisdom and, and take us forward in saying that, how do we actually do it? It's much more uh, sort of credible than what was uh, when Sham started his whole negotiations on climate change on behalf of India and actually behalf of the, the, the world, which was not economically as relevant and what they call the advanced world. So he was more on the side of the developing world and the arguments that he gave, meaning in order to restore this balance of, of nature through a, a title called climate change, I think has been laudatory and I've, I've seen not only the papers, but I've seen him speak starting from Copenhagen to various other forums and I have been very inspired and therefore we want to carry on and uh, supporting some of his uh, thoughts, if not all of his thoughts, but would like you, Sham, to take over, I think, for the next uh, few minutes on the subject of ecology's economy, and then we can move on to natural assets and natural capital. Over to you, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ranjit. And uh, it has been a pleasure to uh, work together with you and the Bali Para Foundation on uh, something uh, that is a uh, really a subject uh, on which uh, I think um, considerable passion has been uh, deployed both by you <laughs> and by me. And, um, you know, we have perhaps uh, not been able to make much progress until recently. But as you said, uh, thanks to the impact of uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I think uh, there is a new uh, focus on uh, ecology and how ecology links itself up with what may at first sight not appear to be directly uh, related domains, uh, such as uh, public health or uh, such as the, uh, you know, the fate of the uh, global economy, as you mentioned. Uh, so let me begin by pointing out that uh, if you look at our uh, current uh, accounting system, which are used all over the uh, world. Uh, you know, these accounting systems are not very uh, well geared to handling what may be called, you know, uh, social capital as well as social uh, and, 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 you know, uh, what may be called external economies. Uh, so uh, let me just try to explain what I have uh, in mind. One is that uh, if you take, uh, for example, uh, a, a figure that I have used again and again, that uh, the, currently the accounting system uh, gives value to, for example, when a tree is cut down in a forest and it is sold as timber, uh, that is a value for the current accounting system. You are generating uh, income out of that capital that you have cut down uh, and that is what makes us uh, rich in a sense. However, what ecology means and what social capital and value means is, are we able to handle the value of a tree which is growing in the forest and the value which it is creating for us? Uh, and are we able to come to a point where the reality that we have today, that a tree growing in the forest has greater value than a tree which has been cut down and it is even being used as timber. Unless that economy is somehow, you know, in a, in a sense, uh, resolved, uh, you will have forests which will be cut down. You will have the kind of erosion of 
you know, the Amazon uh, uh, forests, rainforests that is uh, currently taking place, vast acreages which are being destroyed through burning so that they can be cleared for uh, cultivation. But the value that is being lost as a result of that clearing of those forests, that value in, cur in current accounting terms, in current market terms, does not have value. Or at least does not have value which you can market. Uh, that is the problem. So I think the first order of business is that once we have now realized that ecology is really the foundation of all economic activity and no economy is possible without ecology, then how do we translate that into our accounting systems? You know, uh, and that, that is one issue. And the other issue which, uh, you know, current accounting systems are not able to handle is also the feedback loops or cross domain nature of the challenges which we face. So to give you an example, you know, when the farmer uses chemical fertilizers to increase his crop yield, he uses very toxic pesticides to keep his crops free of pests. However, the cost that is being paid by him in terms of, say, increased health costs, because when he is exposed to those very toxic chemicals, he suffers sometimes from lung diseases, he suffers from, you know, uh, problems with his eyesight, uh, skin diseases. Uh, the, the current uh, surveys which have been done show that more farmers have committed suicide, not because of crop failure, but because they have been bankrupted by health costs. Uh, so this exposure to those kind of kind of uh, uh, you know toxic uh, substances, uh, you don't take account of that because you are only interested in crop yields. That is what you see as creating value. The downside of it is not being taken into account. Once you start taking those into account, say for example, those health costs are added to the cost of production of the crops your whole economy will change. Absolutely. But it doesn't take that into account. It is no less real than what you are doing with respect to increasing your crop, uh, crop yields. So uh, my point is that uh, very good that leaders across the world, including uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, in his recent conversation with uh, President-elect Biden has talked about how important this is. Uh, other countries have committed themselves to, for example, having zero emission economies by 2050 at least. So this is good news. But you know, in terms of translating that good news into action on the ground, I think it is very important that something that Balipara Foundation and you yourself have been uh, you know, also doing a lot of work on is really looking at how do we, in fact, uh, bring about a valuation of ecology that is translatable into market value. That is uh, something which is very uh, fundamental. So uh, I would hope that this work uh, can be carried out further. So uh, any other issue that you would raise, I would be very happy to respond. Yeah, in fact, I think uh, really what you've put the perspective of saying that the starting point is value. And unless you value nature, you know, all the rest is a discussion that will be skirting the real subject of, of nature. So this leads to actually the new subject, which everybody talks about is the new economic impact analysis. So there's a bill, the government actually in every country has an EIA, but the EIA doesn't talk about really the negative value of actually environmental impact. They only talk about the positive value. So if you put up a dam, they will tell you about the 100-year process of how a dam is going to produce electricity, and therefore the payback period is around there. With no reference at all, even if they say there's a biodiversity loss, and they define biodiversity by plant, trees, and maybe fish and animals, they don't actually really refer to this. So the very, very fact that economic uh, sort of activity gets precedence 
without understanding that without actually that ecology that is helping to get create that water and helping to store the water for electricity is linked even if there's no value the point is that we are just destroying the very uh, fixed deposit that actually gives you the interest for example if in that same context if you extend it and say that okay there's limestone so limestone is as one of the ingredients in major ones that create the building so basically the the eia basically therefore is a misnomer i think it's just justifying elements but whoever put in the eia and i'm trying to do a historical uh, sort of perspective it seems that mrs gandhi's time they introduced this whole economic uh, sort of impact that industry will have and uh, it was in her time that they pushed it and therefore at that point in time everybody said it is impacting development in terms of connectivity but impacted roads etc etc so i think i don't know how you as a uh, sort of leading bureaucrat and a person who's been teaching the subject of governance for so long in whichever aspect be it foreign affairs or india how would you react to the fact that there is an eia and we yet our ecology is being destroyed is there something wrong or is it non compliance or meaning is it just that economics precedes everything else <laughs> well it is a bit of all uh, the factors that you mentioned uh, you know i think uh, what uh, is perhaps the most uh, critical element in this whole exercise is that uh, you know somehow or the other we have made the mistake of putting uh, e e economic interests uh, in contradiction to ecological integrity uh, not realizing that actually uh, if you do not have sustainable development then you have development which is going to really be a, a dead end very soon so if the uh, environmental integrity and ecological integrity are in fact the necessary conditions for development they are not a detraction from development so the reason why we have these contradictions that is saying oh ecology is important environment is important but you know development we must uh, have you know em more employment for people we may have should have higher standard living for people and therefore we have to make some sacrifices with respect to the ecology and environment uh, that is the argument that we hear all the time but actually uh, you see this is a completely uh, misplaced argument because as i said what is not being realized is that the very objective that you are putting forward of development of creating greater employment for for uh, people these objectives cannot be met unless in fact unless the ecology is preserved unless environmental integrity is ensured because as you yourself pointed out that really the ecology that we are talking about is like a fixed deposit it is the asset capital asset from which we draw resources and create incomes create value so it stands to reason that if you are constantly eating up your capital then where are you going to have the source for future income so i think this is one of the things that uh, in terms of the environmental impact assessment that you spoke about which was a very laudable initiative which was introduced by mrs indira gandhi but you know its original uh, uh, mandate and its original intent has been lost because what we are now talking about is how do we make certain that the environment does not become what we think like a constraint on our ability to exploit natural resources that is what uh, its intent has become uh, it is no longer the original intent which i think mrs gandhi had in had in mind so this is uh, something which uh, i think needs to be uh, clearly understood that we must not neglect the fact that natural resources the whole ecology not only for india but for the planet as a whole represents a very rich capital source if you draw it down precipitously if you are going to end up in a situation 
where you are eroding nature you are ravaging nature beyond its ability to regenerate then you are going to end up with a complete erosion of the very source of development the very source of uh, you know value that we are talking about so that's one uh, aspect the second aspect is and also a aspect which is uh, perhaps uh, completely completely uh, missed out is that as i said there are various uh, domains of ecology that are all interconnected we are not able to see the interconnections amongst the different domains of ecology because our whole approach has been very very narrowly focused we approach we we operate in stove pipes we operate in very very narrow domains we look at investment in one domain and the impact in that domain we do not see the larger picture because reality is that every aspect of life is interconnected and these can interconnections are very fragile but they can be very easily disturbed so those interconnections which are really the very foundation of life that is something which needs to be brought out into the open because only when people realize that what you are doing in one domain is actually impacting or creating difficulties for you in another domain you will continue with the kind of uh, you know situation that we have so you talked about for example uh, you know hydroelectric dams now in the northeast where you are sitting today there are large number of hydroelectric power projects uh, which are uh, you know coming on stream my own uh, you know uh, work in this area i was doing border infrastructure surveys now when i was visiting these areas what i found was that the environmental impact study that you are talking about was done individually for each project okay so it was if we set up a dam on the uh, you know uh, one one uh, river then we are looking at the impact only in terms of that particular area the total impact of say 10 hydroelectric dams taken together over the ecology of the entire northeast nobody has looked at so the environmental impact study atomized kind of the studies will never give you the full picture of what the total impact would be if you have something like 8 to 10 hydroelectric power stations which have been which have which are being constructed this is another failing so environmental impact study is it fulfilling its original mandate that is one second is there a, a a way of trying to link the total impact the macro impact of various kinds of projects we are doing in a particular geographical area both these things are missing from our current approach no in fact actually you're right and i think this is, this this merits not only another interview but another recording i think we could in fact write a book because what we've learned even more is the direct impact of a dam into the downstream activities of a riverine civilization like that of uh, assam and bangladesh has not been measured as a result there is siltation and as a result when in the monsoons the silt is so high you feel as if you are you are actually there's a sea from dibrugarh when you look uh, towards north takimpur there's a sea you won't believe that actually that this is a river only yeah. because of the siltation and the impact it has had on all downstream civilization impacts i believe that actually this whole impact analysis which is one one stream oriented and actually is not downstream oriented it's upstream oriented and everything that was done was uh, upstream for example in the soban city i'm not saying it's bad so let's move on to a positive side i think we need electricity there is modernization there are two impacts that countries like this and states like this uh, really are uh, not uh, sort of benefit have not got you, well let me let me just interject here that you know river systems are not like property which can be divided amongst different countries or different states absolutely absolutely you know absolutely. so you have to look at a river as a living system correct if you try and break it up into fragments 
don't be surprised if that living system you know starts getting weaker and weaker and ultimately dies completely so this is uh, looking at river as a complete system from origination in the glaciers right down to where it comes out and joins the ocean that entire stretch has to be looked at in a comprehensive in a kind of a you know a, a, a total kind of a uh, ma manner what is happening is uh, nepal is looking at what <laughs> is happening during the of the uh, of the course of the river in its territory india is looking at only what's happening in its territory bangladesh is looking at uh, it as far as its own na narrow interests are concerned when if you actually looked at the river in its totality and you nurtured that river as a living system then all the countries involved would actually benefit their 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 the 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 benefits that they can get from that river system will be there for all of the uh, countries uh, involved and today the other major problem is that look at what is happening with respect to the uh, you know contamination of river waters thanks to the use of you know chemical fertilizers thanks to the you know burgeoning use of for example plastics which are clogging many of the river systems all of this is flowing into the sea and if you look at the bay of bengal today bay of bengal today is a dead zone you know if you look at it <laughs> scientifically it it is now reached a point where no marine life can survive uh, in that particular stretch of ocean space so uh, you cannot solve this problem by taking away those hazardous uh, substances or uh, those pollutants from the bay of bengal the answer lies right across the river system from where it has originated right to the point where it is coming out in the ocean so i think uh, you know uh, the manner in which uh, uh, even if states today as we uh, said earlier uh, are perhaps becoming more conscious of the climate change aspect the environmental aspect than before and this is something which is very welcome but when you drill it down to the ground level of the kind of measures which are required i believe that we still have uh, quite some distance to go no no absolutely brilliant two points actually one is uh, closer to the family i think your son uh, nakul i think he does i think a lot in terms of water oceanography and the entire business about life marine systems and the value thereof i think uh, at some point in time maybe we should discuss it with him uh, but i think on one oh, of you the should call him on your program and uh, i'm sure that he will have a lot to say about some of the subjects that we are talking about yeah no but i think he he would uh, be a fantastic resource to us you know to take this forward and i think he has highlighted that you know india's large coastal zone has neither been developed it has been misutilized in my conversation with him and actually we've not been able to get the benefit of any of the benefits that actually the entire sea line and coastline gives either for transportation or food systems you know both of them which are really rich for so i was quite inspired by him so we've got another young saran who's coming uh, sort of up and probably influencing even more than his father did but just coming back i think our our entire process in balipara foundation and we are so happy that's the way it's panning out we've always said this the eastern himalayas and one of the reason we said eastern himalayas is not because there is no geography and the eastern himalayas we have speakers and participants from bangladesh bhutan nepal north bengal sikkim the northeastern states and myanmar that is the length of what we are doing because we just believe that the entire river system here other than the mekong and other than the fact that the ganges and other uh, systems which actually all emanate in tibet is that we have focused on this and not gone into political borders and our discussions now with the scientists and people in bangladesh and in bhutan have been uh, ranging from uh, discussions from snow line to sea line in fact and is not really uh, a discussion anymore about what's happening in the padda or the brahmaputra you know so i think we've really gained by that this whole concept of 
Eastern Himalayas. The other point which actually sums up a lot of what you said is nature nomics. And nature nomics is actually the interdependence between nature and economics and the values that we propose there. And the, the degraded values of nature nomics is the sum total of that is less than the sum total of only developing nature or only developing economics. So that's something again that we've worked with Yale University and with London School of Economics and with uh, a local university here in, in Guwahati to see that this whole thing goes ahead. But coming closer to the Eastern Himalayan Naturomics Forum 2020, we've got actually five outcomes that we are focusing on. And I think in uh, our invitation to you, which will be accepted, maybe you've, 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 you've gone through most of them, I'm sure. But really, is this concept, therefore, of naturomics developing rural uh, benefits? Therefore, if asset value is actually nature, what about rural asset value and therefore nature? Don't we think that if we put asset value and we add a rural asset value, the sum total of that is actually greater than all the metropolitan value, despite whatever we've been saying. And we've done some back of envelope calculations. So we believe time has come for what is called the rural uh, renewal mission and not the urban renewal mission. That is one. Two, we actually believe that we have, we have done a back of envelope calculation to show that we can create between 30 to 50 million jobs just in this entire area of India, but definitely in the area of the economic, uh, uh, meaning the, the area of the ecological footprint of the Eastern Himalayas. And we've actually worked that out by item, whether it be refilling uh, what do you call wells, whether it be re-silting, whether it be transferring of fertile uh, sort of soil, whether it be saying that don't cut the, don't cut the uh, sort of, uh, mountains and hills, but actually take all the silt that is coming from the river and make the riverine silt the new big industry and the new hope and the new horizon placement. Then we talked about actually natural assets and how do we create natural assets and go ahead. So our plan was that to, uh, to actually create natural assets as in trees of different values, whether it's like bamboo or whether it be uh, cane or whether it be longer term trees of 30, 40 years. And we've done an economic model to show that in one in 100 hectares of land or even one hectare of land, what really could be the medicinal value, the food value, et cetera, et cetera, from that natural product of regenerating. And therefore, we're talking about natural asset creation. And then we're talking about two other very important things, the concept of net zero. And we're saying that if there is net zero, as you had alluded to earlier, that by 2050, people are working towards uh, net zero. I think it would be uh, of, of great asset. But last but not least, again, a subject that we talked about was health. And this whole concept of zoonotic diseases, which people actually have not even started looking at, the entire concept of zoonotic diseases, animal human diseases, which have happened because of deforestation, not just deforestation, everything to do around land, energy, waste, water, air, and carbon. That entire cycle has been actually impacted and zoonotic diseases spread, like the one we're going through, corona, is actually linked with, with, with forests and deforestation. And now they're writing much more about it. If these were the five things that we could achieve uh, from this conference, I think we would be really happy. I would like your comment specifically on one, which is this animal uh, sort of human, uh, diseases called zoonotic diseases. What do you think, meaning, could be done immediately in the short run to help us uh, counter this? As I <clears throat> pointed out earlier, um, one uh, good result of uh, our having to face this uh, enormous challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has been to, in fact, focus attention worldwide on what you said, uh, the zoonotic uh, diseases, and what are the uh, you know causes uh, for that. And going forward, if we wish to avoid such kind of crises uh, in the future, then uh, unless we address those uh, longer term causes, uh, structural causes, uh, we will not be able to succeed. Uh, so the immediate, of course, um, uh, answer to this is uh, what is being done today, which is to try and find uh, 
in an effective vaccine. And uh, we have had some good news about uh, the possible availability of the vaccine in the near future. But uh, that is not the end of the story. This is essentially a band-aid solution to what is a much bigger uh, uh, problem. Uh, so just one uh, particular, uh, particular figure that uh, today, if you look at the mammalian population across the world, uh, the wild species have shrunk to something like, you know, uh, four to 5% only. The rest of the mammalian population and particularly, you know, domesticated animals like uh, cattle or uh, pigs or goats, uh, these, are, these are actually occupying virtually the entire globe now. Uh, uh, and they have literally taken over uh, the habitat of the, of the wild uh, species. Uh, and yet the survival of those wild species is absolutely integral to one, maintaining the ecology. Number two, its ability, the ability of the ecology to continue to generate wealth and income for, uh, for humanity. Uh, so uh, it is that structural problem that needs to be uh, uh, resolved. Because if we do not do that, uh, these, uh, these kind of diseases will continue to uh, emerge because uh, the interface between wild animals and domesticated animals, that is increasing. And number two, the interface between human beings and animals is also uh, increasing. And the other factor which we have to also look at is the whole aspect of, you know, uh, the trade in uh, wildlife, which is, which is uh, illegal trade in wildlife. Uh, and it is linked to certain cultural factors, you know, looking at some of these wild species as uh, gourmet uh, food <laughs> sources uh, in some parts of the, uh, of the world. There are, uh, in, no, shall I say value system issues uh, that if we do not address those in time, uh, we will not be able to resolve these problems. So I think uh, it is very good that the current uh, pandemic at least has had the result of focusing our attention on the importance of maintaining ecology, the importance of preserving the habitat of wilder species, of somehow limiting the, uh, the expansion, the, the, the incredible expansion that is taking place of uh, domesticated uh, animals, which are, which are food sources, uh, and uh, trying to see how we can have a much more balanced kind of a lifestyle. Ultimately, this is a issue of human values. Uh, we can't get away from that. Uh, because unless that value system itself alters, uh, all that we are trying to do through finding technical solutions, through you know, the development of technology, uh, these are not going to help us in dealing with this uh, challenge. And this is where I feel uh, somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat uh, you know, depressed that uh, you know, India actually, in terms of its traditional value system, was very, very geared to, in fact, looking at nature as a source of nurture looking at nature as a mother, you know, a value system which said, don't take away from your mother what exceeds her ability to regenerate, as I said. Because one of the great qualities of nature is precisely that regeneration quality, you know. Nature regenerates itself. You have seen in uh, your own uh, region itself, wherever, you know, an effort has been made to try and have a greater balance in terms of, you know, how we, uh, how we treat nature, uh, nature has been able to spring back into life very quickly. So that regeneration is something which is a great uh, asset, I think, for us. But then you must not, you know, exploit nature beyond its ability to regenerate. That is very important. And that is a value which is very deeply ingrained in India's own civilizational attributes. So uh, when we are today talking about in India, you know, how we should, you know, value our own culture and value our own traditions, I would hope that as part of that, we also have a, a certain 
uh, reassessment of those aspects of our of our traditional culture which will in fact help us in dealing with this this very very important ecological challenge uh, that we are talking about don't forget that in the indian system you know we don't make a distinction between humanity and the rest of life all living forms so it is man in nature not man conquering nature you know that is uh, something which is uh, very very uh, deeply as i said embedded in um, in the in the indian ethos uh, somehow we have uh, uh, divert diverted ourselves from that uh, uh, ethos into something very different uh, if uh, somehow we can uh, regenerate that you know sort of uh, sort of uh, civilizational civilizational attributes of our uh, of our culture and our country uh, it would make a very big difference yeah, i think you know just uh, thank you for that because i think you covered a uh, lot of ground one element in terms of the uh, resource and zoonotic diseases is again back to the ocean the entire fish species and protein species for people who eat fish is also being impacted so are seaweeds and so is everything under there so i think to add to that it's just not land forces it's also sea forces that are very very big part of this whole uh, dimension of disease spread but coming coming back i think to your uh, sort of concept of value i think uh, it's absolutely important and my one interaction uh, uh, which you sort of facilitated and took me to the dalai lama and not that i'm uh, sort of uh, uh, promoting any one aspect but dalai lama does talk on the subject of values and talks about the nalanda school and talks in that in the nalanda school even divided about actually the culture that india exported which now the world is embracing and in that a very important component is the balance of life you know and that, that balance of life is all life including human species so i think you've covered that well so you are the new sort of guru as far as uh, the balance is oh, hardly <laughs> I, i don't think i aspire to that kind of a status but, but uh, anyway no but i think uh, we have had a very uh, very very good conversation and i think we should have more conversations uh, Uh, of this uh, nature because the more we are able to expose people to number one the kind of uh, crises that humanity is facing you know i think there is a up to a certain point one can say that you know there is a greater realization of you know the challenge that is upon us uh, but at another level i still feel that uh, we are a guilty of a kind of a collective blindness you know where uh, we continue to believe that somehow you know technology will find answers to some of these problems that we are facing without our having to change our lifestyles without our having to give up what we think is our entitlement uh, okay. you know that is the kind of a, 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 a if you if you say subliminal kind of a uh feeling that uh, you know humanity as a whole seems to uh, have yeah. so i think unless we shake people out of this collective blindness and really make them see what the reality is uh i am afraid uh, we will not be able to make much progress uh, beyond tinkering at the uh, edges so that is something which is very important and i would hope that uh, badipara foundation will continue to Uh, help us in uh, in ex exposing uh, you know uh, our people and people across the world uh, to number one the enormity of the challenge that we are facing it is it is really an extraordinary challenge to the very survival of of uh, humanity uh, and not just humanity but you know this one planet that we all share and uh, this is the one home that <laughs> all of us have uh it is our responsibility to uh, make certain that if nothing else we uh, leave behind uh, for succeeding generations uh a you know a living system which for so many thousands of years has really nurtured all life uh, which we you know uh, see around us uh, so that's the that's the uh, you know request i would make uh, to uh, the foundation and once again uh compliments to the kind of work uh, that the foundation has been doing and also compliments to you for uh, you know bringing so much of uh, passion 
uh, to this uh, initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sham. I just wanted to say one point when you end, and because uh, I want to lead on uh, from this to this conference. So hi and welcome to everybody. Just the thought for if India has an opportunity, and that opportunity is lead to lead the ecological economy revolution. So instead of the finance minister presenting a finance bill, should it not be that we actually present an ecological bill with all our assets and all the components that you referred to earlier actually should come within the ecological bill? I mean, that's a thought which actually uh, should be uh, conveyed even more at the end of this conference so that the prime minister stands up and says, hey guys, this is our natural asset. These are the trees, this is the water resources. This is the value we have of our ecology. This is how we are going to expend it. This is what we're doing for, for, for uh, what do you call connectivity. This is for education. This is for healthcare. And that's why the value will come about. So this ecological economy is something that we in Balibara Foundation are wanting to push forward. Thank you. Good. Good. And I, I would suggest that you, you write the next Wealth of Nations, like right. Adam Smith did <laughs> more than 200 years ago. Uh, I think the, it is time to have another modern, you know, wealth of nations, uh, which will really focus attention on, you know, the ecological assets uh, and creating value that we spoke about. No, uh, thank, thank you very much for inviting me to have this conversation. Thank you. No, no, thank you. And I, I, I'll come back to you. Now you've given me some more reason to come back for the new wealth. <laughs> thank, thank you. you guys. Thank you. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank right. you. Thank you. Bye. Hi, Amita. So I think the first question, I think that we really want to ask you, uh, what are the biggest challenges ahead for the country, you know, today? And, and do you think that it makes sense actually to bring in this dimensioning of ecological valuation? So, uh, uh, Ranjit, according to me, you know, uh, India is the fifth most vulnerable country to climate change. And uh, it ranks 89th in climate resilience out of 181 countries. And the World Economic uh, Forum's 2020 Global Risk Report has dubbed nature and biodiversity loss the biggest risks facing businesses today. Natural disasters threaten physical assets like never before. And this year alone in India, we have seen super cyclone Amphan, devastating floods in Assam, locust invasions along the western coast of India. Uh, last year, we saw one of the most severe heat waves in our recorded meteorological history, and nearly 30 lakh people lost their homes of two floods. We lose close to about 52,000 crore rupees annually because of flooding. And some of our biggest challenges in this new millennium are, uh, you know, uh, according to me, unsustainable agriculture practices and overuse of fertilizer, which have led to desertification, declining pollinator species, water stress, causing overall decline in yields, poison groundwater, and negative health and financial impacts for our rural farmers. Warming temperatures is broadening the range and prevalence of malaria and dengue forest clearances is increasing the risk of zoonotic disease transmission. And air pollution is responsible for nearly 2 million deaths annually. And 190,000 of these were babies. And water contamination through pollution and changing flood patterns has led to an increase in waterborne disease outbreaks. Nearly 60% of our groundwater is contaminated and water conflicts are doubling as compared to the past decades. And therefore our cities will face acute water stress and uh, land degradation uh, caused by forest loss is costing us immensely. And this is just the tipping point for India. Uh, so the lack of climate and ecological resilience will continue to uh, impact lives of people unless we take cross-sectoral action to end poverty, build sustainable livelihoods, and improve access to finance and resources for the rural sector. And that is what this government has done through a series of measures. If you look at the policy measures taken, they bring ecology at center stage. 
sustainability at the heart of the challenge and really development with sustainability today is the key fantastic uh, really good in fact actually it, it's a uh, sort of a continuum of governments and governments but you know because our measure of development and the world development programs are all measured by gdp and gdp as in gross domestic product as against the green domestic product so unfortunately there is no measure and in today where debt is such a big issue i think uh, is it not fair to say that a state like arunachal if we valued their uh, nature uh, capital just in the form of trees and actually converted it into sort of uh, made goods and services don't you think that itself will be able to raise you enough debt i think a country like india can easily fall back by just measuring its its uh, natural resources which are diminishing but definitely in the eastern himalayas and help you to raise debt to achieve all the other dimensions that are required on healthcare education and connectivity how would you react to that no very true and very right because in the northeast uh, i think specifically there are five key transitions which can transform the region to make it a powerhouse for ecology uh you know it it can become a powerhouse of ecology for the economy uh, firstly uh, you know rewild the economy uh, uh, we have to build the natural assets of the northeast and they will create a huge natural cap capital over the next for the next few decades support the indigenous and forest fringe communities and uh, northeast can create jobs for over 10 lakh households through rewilding and agroforestry across an estimated uh, 23 lakh hectares of land and investing in the region's forest could reduce the risk of new zoonoses by up to 40% secondly net zero by 2030 the region needs to invest systematically in decarbonizing its growth by moving away from fossil fuel dependency enhancing infrastructure efficiency and investing in nature based solutions uh using sustainably harvested local natural resources for creating value added products and creating supply chains and marketing networks is critical and eco tourism eastern himalayas according to me hold immense untapped potential for promotion of eco tourism which in turn can create a ripple impact to drive related sectors of the economy uh, what we need for northeast is a nature economics economy to drive this future we need to achieve a balance between rural and urban communities and invest in rural communities to build rural futures opportunities for natural capital employment and socio economic well being through a uh, basic issues such as education and healthcare that reach all population you know we must practice sustainability as the most fundamental level by mapping emissions across our value chains and planning to reduce these emissions through uh, you know sheer uh, abatement actions and innovations for the future mitigation and adaptation and you know it is this drive for adaptation and mitigation that will power india and the northeast to a new growth phase pushing the region to become one of the leading innovators in economic solutions to profound ecological problems if we can do this northeast will truly become the global leader and we have the potential to do this using natural social and economic capital together to unleash a uh, northeast in which ecology is truly the economy thank you so much amitav that really makes a lot of sense and i think it leads on to the next question if strategy drives structure could it not be if that is the strategy that all governments instead of presenting a finance budget and i would be really proud if we say that this is the nature nomics revolution ecological revolution and our prime minister stands there in front of the world and says we present an ecological budget wherein everything else follows including the economy because it's only out of the ecological budget can you have a balance sheet because you know the entire world and uh, looks up to prime minister modi he's dynamic 
he's hardworking and he can actually be innovative. If he can stand up and tell the world that, look, we are now presenting what is called the ecological economic budget for our country, which includes all the social dimensioning of healthcare and uh, what do you call uh, school, education, roads, etc. But the flow through is actually the economic financial system that India will discover now going ahead with a dynamic person like you uh, speaking as you did. So, uh, Ranjit, the Prime Minister has really put ecology at the heart of the challenge by his commitment for 175 gigawatts of energy by 2022 and 450 gigawatt by 2030. We've already achieved a substantial component. Uh, we have made rapid progress in both solar and wind. And, uh, you know, valuation of ecosystem services is one of the ways of assigning tangible value to intangible economic benefits provided by our ecology. And, you know, this is an emerging area of study. Uh, our current limits in comprehending all benefits provided by ecosystems and the complex, uh, you know, the complexity of interconnected factors have uh, resulted so far in partial assessments. By putting economic value on natural assets, we can actually mainstream them and place ecology at the heart of business decision making and thereby rationalize their utilization by the current generation and secure them for future generations. But I would like to stress that ecology has always been the backbone of our economy and indeed human existence. It is only now and increasingly so in the face of abounding scientific evidence that we are coming to appreciate its value. We are seeing that mindless extraction of natural resources and polluting natural things beyond their carrying capacity is actually threatening economic growth and economic development and human lives. More than half of the country's population depends on agriculture for livelihood. Agriculture in its current form is almost completely dependent on nature for water, soil and seeds. Its sustainability is threatened by climate change induced rising temperatures. Rural livelihoods are intimately linked with availability of cheap and easily accessible natural resources. Wow. And you know, industry depends on sustained availability of resources, which many of which are extracted directly from nature and for absorbing pollutants generated by various industrial processes. And therefore, economic output of citizens is critically linked with their health and well-being, which in turn depends on abundance of clean air, water, and soil. And healthy ecosystems actually manage critical uh, bio-geochemical uh, cycles that maintain the fragile balance that makes life on Earth possible today. And this is very important for all of us to understand. No, thank you. Thank you. So that uh, we think that the emphasis on LEWAC, which we've developed of the, in terms of nature nomics, called interdependence between nature and economics, called land, energy, waste, water, air, and carbon. We thought that if these five were, were componentized, how do we actually measure this in addition to the services that we talk about? So what Nick Stern, who you actually have been on forums with, with uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who who, who came into uh, Colombia and then to Assam, we took him around. And we've got Joseph Stiglitz, who actually came to Balipara, a place which you have always supported and actually sort of pushed, but never come there. He has come and actually written about this whole thing of the impact. And the first document on nature nomics was done by Nick Stern and ourselves 15 years, 10 years ago, to 2007, to show that actually whatever Amitabh you're saying, that if we critically assess and measure land, energy, waste, water, air, and carbon, air because of purity and therefore the recyclability, you will get exactly what you want. And in fact, therefore, we are trying to push, and I've been talking to the finance minister, Hemanta, in uh, Guwahati to, to do the first budget. So he's told me, okay, why don't you go and make an attempt and do the budget as if you were finance minister? Is he from, I've got enough work to fight in the field. You tell me, come back and say that this is the budget. And I will make sure that my government actually approves, sees it before I present it. So we are in that 
uh, inflection point and told them about you. He said also to share it with you before we do it. But we are all set to do this. And we've done a lot of papers now in, in 14 years to do this. And what Yale University, London School of Economics, uh, and one more university have agreed, and we're trying to tie Guwahati University in. And if you actually lead us to the School of Economics in Delhi, all of them jointly will make this model, which will be what is called the sustainability index. So I think the sustainability index will also value companies. So if one company's value share is 100, is 200 rupees, minus the economic damage, actually the value is minus 90. So that kind of valuation, or it's plus 190 if there is neutrality. We, we've done the first cut of that and we can, we'll can be happy to share it with you. Wonderful, wonderful. We'll because uh, you're very right, because we must take leadership uh, in actually supporting and financing green initiatives and in creating green jobs. And this is a priority area in the light of growing environmental risk in the form of temperature rise. Uh, you know, increasing frequency of natural disasters and just the eroding adaptive capacity of poor and marginalized people. So what you are saying is very right and I entirely agree with you. Thank you so much, uh, Amitha. If there are any questions for us or directions, we'll be happy to share a single page to show you exactly how one hectare of land can feed this Boro family or the Mishing family and how they are guarding this whole natural asset as an asset now which will be converted into natural capital and thereafter the cycle starts. We'll be very happy to share this with you for you to take it forward and onwards. We know that you represent us very well as people, Indians, and also as a human being. And thank you for all the work that you've been doing and the tourism revolution that you created, not just in Kerala, but for India. Thank you, Amita, for this session. Thank you. Wonderful Great. talking to you. Wonderful talking. Great pleasure. Yes, thank you. We are very, very happy to have you on board with us today at the eighth edition of the Eastern Himalayan Economic Forum and the first virtual edition of the forum. Uh, the theme this Thanks, year Sam. is the theme this year really is ecology is economy, and we really want to use this very interesting but also troubled juncture in the time of the world to sort of bring in experts from around the world and deliberate on what a future-proof world could could look like and how could we use people from all walks of life from business to, to academia to civil society organizations to draft a blueprint for a future in which ecology really forms the backbone of the economy so my first sort of question to you mr narendran would be that you know ecology has always been the backbone of human well-being and has always been the source really of all of our prosperity forever and today how would you define and elaborate on the paradigm of ecology is economy? What would be your views on this paradigm? Thanks very much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for uh, having me on this uh, uh, platform. Uh, to me, uh, ecology and economy are very interdependent. Uh, you know, it cannot be a zero sum game. It cannot be one at the cost of the other. I think uh, uh, oftentimes, uh, more often in the recent past, uh, we've sometimes let the economy override uh, the needs of ecology. And I think we need to get the balance back uh, simply because uh, when you look at the long term, unless you have a strong ecosystem, a strong ecology, the economy cannot survive. So I think mankind is realizing that uh, as we've grown faster and as greater numbers of humankind are there on earth and as uh, the more populous countries uh, make the progress from being underdeveloped to developed, uh, I think the impact of this development in that sense of the term is being felt. So it's a time for us to uh, uh, step back a bit, reflect on it, and look at uh, what would be a more sustainable way to take people out of poverty without uh, impoverishing the uh, ecosystems that they live in and the ecology that there is. So I think finding that balance is key. Uh, science uh, and technology has made a lot of advance uh, advances and uh, we can leverage those advances also to understand the changes happening around us and to find solutions uh, so that uh, uh, we have a more uh, eco-efficient growth ahead of us. And I think countries like India who are uh, very early in this development uh, and continents like Africa, which are even further uh, uh, you know, uh, behind in some sense in that development, 
can choose development paths which uh, have, drive a better balance between the needs of the economy and the needs of the ecology. Well, sir, thanks a lot for that. And I think sort of taking on from this and based on your vast experience, not only in the Indian uh, business scene, but in the global business scene, what according to you is sort of like the prospects or the opportunity of the e e ecological economy in India today and in, in the near future? So like I said, India is uniquely positioned. Uh, we are at an early stage of development and growth. Upper capita is at $2,000, which is a fraction of what it is uh, even in China, forget the ritual. Yeah. So uh, as we go down this path of economic development, we have an opportunity to choose a, a more resource efficient path for economic development. We have an opportunity to leverage the technologies that exist today, which were not existing even 10, 15 years back when other countries ahead of us uh, went down this path. We have the knowledge uh, and the consciousness and the awareness uh, today that probably we didn't have as a community 15, 20 years back. So I think uh, there are great opportunities for India to uh, uh, you know, follow this path very judiciously. A lot of the uh, richer parts of India geologically, and I say this uh, because I'm in the metals and mining business, uh, also are uh, the richest parts of India from a biodiversity point of view. Uh, they are also the poorest parts of India currently from an economic point of view. You know, so again, how do we find the balance uh, so that we can create jobs uh, which uh, are uh, uh, you know, not in conflict with uh, what is right for the ecology is something for us to think about. And I think uh, there are many things that we can do. Even if you look at the principles of a circular economy, if uh, you look at uh, companies uh, designing for resource efficiency, products which can be reused, products which can be repaired, developing business systems we plug into it, Tata Steel itself is doing a lot of this work. Tata Steel is looking at how can we create value from waste, Tata Steel is looking at how can we recycle all the products that we make and all the byproducts that we make. So uh, if you keep investing in driving resource efficiency, uh, building on the concepts of a circular economy, uh, doing uh, uh, sustainable mining, sustainable uh, you know, manufacturing, uh, uh, living in harmony with the communities around us, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, also repairing and refreshing the lands that are uh, impacted by our footprint. I think there's a lot that can be done and I think in India we can choose these paths. The regulatory environment needs to uh, support it. The uh, uh, environment that is there to deploy the regulation should support it. We should celebrate role modelship amongst corporates. We should educate uh, uh, the community, including the students, the younger generation, talk about it in the schools. Uh, so there's a lot that needs to be done. And uh, I think the pandemic has also reminded us of the need uh, to even focus on uh, zoonotic uh, diseases, uh, focus on deforestation and its impact, and uh, what a pandemic uh, can do to really uh, uh, devastate uh, large uh, parts of the world and uh, really uh, make all of us equal and vulnerable very quickly. Yeah. So I think uh, the last six months has created a platform for all of us to reflect even deeper on these subjects than we've done in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, sir. And I think so uh, over the last few minutes, you've, you've talked about the opportunities and also sort of about some of the challenges that we have ahead on us. If you sort of had to classify these challenges in the immediate future, I think that we as a country and that also the Northeast of India as this greater region, these challenges that we really have to overcome say, in, in, the, in the immediate future to be able to even think and create a future which is resilient. What do you think are these sort of like the major challenges that we need to watch out for and we need to brace ourselves for? So I think there is this uh, uh, urgent need to make sure that uh, the ecology is not uh, disturbed more than required. While at the same time, we cannot deny the fact that probably a million people are out there looking for jobs, a million new people are looking for jobs every month, right? Yeah. So uh, we cannot ignore the social consequences of not creating those jobs, and those jobs cannot be created so easily, yeah. right? Yeah. 
So uh, that's why it's not about solving one problem, but not looking at the other. I think oftentimes we are focused on the problem which is in front of us and not focused on the problems we create by solving the problem in front of us. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, platforms such as these are a good beginning to discuss different viewpoints, find solutions. It's not just about finding one solution for a problem and not thinking of the other problem, right? So finding those solutions which can address multiple problems at the same time, uh, you know, finding versatile solutions to me is very key. And, uh, you know, uh, so we should uh, brainstorm between uh, specialists, between industry, between academia, between uh, uh, communities. And uh, it's not a one size fit all, fits all. There would be local solutions depending on the local ecosystem and opportunities uh, could be very local. Uh, the solution could be very global. Uh, you could scale up uh, the solutions uh, today in a digital environment much more quickly than you could earlier. For instance, uh, if you create some eco-friendly products in the Northeast, very quickly you can reach to markets across the world, which could not have happened earlier, right? So technology allows you to connect uh, you know, uh, the source with the uh, consumer uh, very quickly. So I think a lot of micro enterprises, a lot of uh, working on the ground, a lot of uh, innovation and technology use in solving uh, social problems, uh, ecological problems. Um, and I think uh, getting a lot of startups to also work in this area, allowing them to use a creativity. And I think making sure that there is capital available for such ideas and there is a lot of capital looking for uh, responsible uh, investments. So I think uh, getting everything together, uh, uh, you know, is uh, one way of uh, uh, solving this problem. So it's not going to be easy, but I think uh, having platforms to have a discussion with multiple stakeholders is a starting point. Perfect. Thanks a lot. And sir, I think uh, you mentioned capital and what we, through the course of our work over the last 12 years, have been talking about a lot is natural capital, you know, and, and how natural capital really forms the basis to support human capital. But, and also, if you think about it, supports all sorts of other financial capitals across the world. Um, but when, when climate change, overpopulation, and things like pollution threaten nature, societies and economies are thereby threatened as well. And natural capital has sort of forever been considered to be free, you know, um, which, which really causes uh, the benefits that nature provides to be taken for granted many a times, and also used currently at a rate at which the earth cannot replenish this so quickly, and also the fact that we need multiple earths to support the current sort of situation on Earth. So, and, and also, you, uh, you know, from, from the vast experience that the Tata Group has in, in natural capital accounting and, and as a part of the Nature Capital Coalition worldwide, how do you really think that we must sort of begin to, to value this natural capital and our natural assets, which, which form this capital, and, and use this as a means to transform and redesign this future that we are talking about and that we are, to, we are seeking to, to co-create, not just through the forum, but through a global movement, just really to be able to create a future that is more resilient, more participative, but also more sustainable. So what would be your thoughts on this idea? So I think uh, there is a beginning which is being made when companies have integrated reports and they talk about the natural capital, the human capital, the financial capital and manufacturing capital and everything else. The Tata Steel integrated report also talks about that, right? But again, it's a good starting point for a corporate because when you yeah. start creating the document, you start thinking about it more holistically than you would uh, if you were bringing out a traditional annual report with a focus just on the financial okay. metrics, right? Yeah. So yeah. that itself creates a consciousness and awareness uh, uh, in the organization. Uh, secondly, the regulatory environment also needs to encourage that. And I think in India, uh, there's been a lot which has been happening in that space as well. And I think uh, even over the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of uh, regulation uh, uh, quite progressive, while at the same time, uh, you know, it can uh, be difficult for people to transition, but I think uh, keeping in mind uh, the future needs, I think some of that is, um, uh, you know, I think welcome, is inevitable uh, and something that everyone has to adapt to. So if you look at uh, sustainable mining, for instance, because the mining industry has been uh, getting the wrong end of the stick for a long time and sometimes uh, justifiably so, 
uh, but it's not that everyone in the mining industry is doing a bad job. There are yeah. very good role models and there are very poor examples, right? So how do you encourage good behavior? How do you then allow uh, uh, people who practice sustainable mining to self-certify a lot of stuff so that they don't have that much of regulation as an oversight? Yeah. So, yeah. so to me, uh, the regulatory environment, the, uh, uh, the reporting environment, and many other things needs to encourage us valuing uh, natural uh, uh, capital. Mm -hmm. And uh, then internally, companies can also take a view uh, that uh, they can embed it with the way they think about investments, right? So right, right. to give an example, uh, in Tata Steel, we use uh, uh, notional cost of carbon. Uh, yeah. when we take investment decisions, right? Yeah. So uh, so that kind of uh, allows you to, in some sense, uh, financially justify a project yeah. which may not have otherwise got that support because yeah. Yeah. let's say if you say, I'm going to value this carbon at 15 euros a ton or 25 euros a ton because yeah. Yeah. that's a cost of carbon in Europe, yeah. Yeah. then uh, you know that adds to the uh, way you evaluate projects. And that's also one way of saying that how do I measure the impact that I'm having on the environment? And while it is the reverse of natural capital, it is yeah. more a, a perspective on, am I destroying natural capital? And what is that cost? And how am I building that into my investment proposal? So yeah. I think this is a subject which is still evolving. Uh, you know, it needs to move from more from an art into a science. And then, you know, then companies if you standardize on the metrics, the standardize on the way you will measure it, standardize on the way you will report it, then uh, you can have comparable numbers, com companies and countries can benchmark with each other, and then, you know, keep pushing the boundaries and improving uh, the performance, uh, uh, you know, for the better of humanity. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot, Mr. Tarendran, for your uh, leadership address. I'm, I'm sure this will serve as an inspiration to the corporate world that looks up to you and the, and the responsibility that, that your organization means in the country. We will be using sort of uh, certain, certain takeaways from this interview to create a draft policy blueprint, not just for India, but for the Northeastern, the greater Northeastern part of the Eastern Himalayas. And we'll be in touch with you to take that forward in the very near future. Thank you so much, Mr. Narendra, for your time. Uh, we, you, we absolutely appreciate it. Hello, Valipara Foundation. Thank you so much for asking me to be part of your Naturenomics Congress. Um, you call it Naturenomics. I like the term. I often call it nature-based solutions. And I'm Daisy Redrissenaar. I'm working a lot on aligning the economy, ecology, and the human spirit, as I call it. And nature-based solutions is a big part of that. Uh, I'm very glad that a lot is happening in this field. Last year, there have been big reports of, by the United Nations and the European Union and the World Bank about nature-based solutions. And they are taking off, I think. Let me share my screen with you and let me show you what they are. An illustration from the IUCN. The IUCN illustrates it like this, and I explain it often as um, solutions for humans. They create multiple values for humans, for economies, and they create multiple values for biodiversity, for nature. So if you combine them, then we can really have an economy that matters. Our economy as it is now is based on scarcity and ecology is always based on uh, abundance. Uh, ecology is always abundant. Nature doesn't know any, any different. So if we take ecology as a basis for our economy, we will be able to create an abundant economy as well. For me, that always starts with ecosystem restoration. Um, the years that I've been working now in this field, I've done a lot of ecosystem restoration and it's really possible to restore ecosystems. 
to make sure that the degraded areas, the overgrazed areas, the polluted areas by um, fertilizers, too much fertilizers and um, um, chemicals, chemical sprays, that we restore them. And you see it in big scale as well. It's like the Lost Plateau in China. It's a, a, a whole area, the size of the Netherlands, my country. And it has been restored. And now the farmers really know how to create their crops like that. And they have food and they have resources for products. So how will it um, work? I think we need a lot of systemic design. It all starts with designing the systems, designing the waste, designing without pollution, designing in such a way that ecosystems are happy and the humans are happy. We also should show that it's possible because there are lots of companies doing it. Um, and it's very important to experiment further. There's still a lot we don't know. There's still a lot of science that's needed and we need to do. So how can we break from traditional industrialization? Um, I think the most important thing is that we think in value and not just in money. We create multiple values with one business case. We can use synergy instead of scale to build value upon value upon value in a business case. And it's very important to do it in a local setting because everything we create should be embedded in local ecosystems and in local culture. Innovation and technology should have one focus and that's life. We should not create the technologies that destroy life. We should really think just life. And then we can create a lot. It doesn't all have to be technology either. We can do a lot of design solutions and um, do it smart. Do it smart in the ways that nature teaches us. This year I was in Indonesia in a project where they create a perfect environment for um, restoring mangrove forests. Um, they built dams and then the sediments are coming in and being trapped. And then the seeds in the soil will germinate and will regrow into uh, forests of mangroves. So that's a really good design solution because they also combine that with uh, organic fish farming and other ways of creating things with the forests and with the ecosystems. Also, I see a lot of innovation nowadays with local abundantly available materials like bamboo, like industrial hemp, like seaweeds. We can make fabrics with that. We can um, uh, make cosmetics, we can make food and uh, animal feed. So it's all possible. On a macroeconomic level, I think it's very important that governments make radical choices and invest uh, the money to unleash the businesses that we really want. Help them for a, a, a big, yeah, a bit of a start because the startups, they really need uh, some some investment money and then they can create a business cases that will stand on their own and really be resilient. Then we can also phase out what we don't want anymore and we should be rather radical in that I think. In 2016 I was in Aliado and Aliado is in the smallest Canary Island in Spain and we were there with a big group of the Blue Economy all entrepreneurs, all um, yeah, working in one field or another in this new, uh, yeah, naturenomics. In Aliero, they have already done it for about 25 years and they started out with energy and water. They have made renewable energy and they merged the energy and water company so they don't compete but find solutions together. They make fresh water by desalination and use the energy for that. 
And also a lot of the proceeds, the revenues of that company stay in the local community because the community owns part of the company. So a lot of the money stays in the system and can build new projects in the economy. They restored their ecosystems with Terra Preta in eight years time, made it organic. And then now they're building all kinds of value from winemaking to um, fisheries, they restore the oceans. Um, so yeah, it's a really good example. And it was very inspiring for me to see that it can happen in an area. And at this moment, I see a lot of areas now, yes, yeah, starting out, trying it, um, starting with one project or the first three, and then, yeah, who knows what will be unleashed. In your area, you have the Assam tea plantation, uh, an organic tea plantation, and I hope there might be a, a, a in connection to a lot of the other nationomics ways to do stuff. So I really hope it takes off from there. So what are the steps for a resilient local economy? I think it all starts with ecosystem restoration. I think it's also very important that we are um, self-sustaining on basic needs. This is the basic needs. We can really create a very active self-sustaining economy on that. We can ask caring tourists to come and um, contribute to our economy and we will be restoring ecosystems. I think that's the most important thing to do. And I really hope that it will take off in your area in the Eastern Himalayas. And if you want to reach out, um, just do so. I can be found on LinkedIn and on Medium where I share a lot of stories on the projects that I do. My name is Desiree Drissenaar. Under that name, you can also reach out and I'm really happy to hear from you and to see, to see how it's really building up in the Eastern Himalayas. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Esteemed online participants, a very warm welcome to the eighth edition of the Eastern Himalayas Naturonomics Forum. This is the first time this has gone virtual and digital due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which is affecting all of our lives in some form or the other. We all got used to this medium since April of this year, or even earlier, and this has become the new normal. The global health crisis and the collaboration on a global basis with regard to a vaccine coming into distribution is very visible. We hope some of these successes, some of these endeavors will ensure that every single individual on this planet irrespective of the disparity in income, we'll get the benefit of the vaccine and we all will be able to get together as we did before, but with a lot of concern for nature and a concern for ecology, ecology in addition to the economic well-being. This new normal of digitization and digital connect is helping us all to understand the dangers of playing with nature and ignoring it. It's only critical that we all understand this and participate in it in all ways to save the planet, save further pandemics and take actions which we will not miss out, we cannot afford to have this kind of deaths 
and we must be absolutely clear. I think a future scenario where the pandemic will be a way of life through the extensive ecological damage that has been done over the years, over the decades, I think the combination of air pollution, waste pollution, and the use of materials which can suffocate the planet must be contained at any cost. Populations have been displaced during this pandemic and the migrant force, migrant population has come to suffer the most during this period. It's our responsibility collectively to look at economic development, not at the cost of ecological issues, but economics and ecology must come hand in hand so that we become responsible citizens, responsible corporations, responsible NGOs or civil society as the case may be. Governments have a role to play, governments will continue to play, but the policy making and the behavior in terms of operationalizing the same must be absolutely clear and absolutely understood. The economic activity has slowed down tremendously during this period. This is also affecting in multiple ways the citizens of our country in terms of loss of jobs, loss of livelihood, and loss of health. Public health and the capacity to support people through public health endeavors at an affordable cost has suffered because of the scale of the need and also capacity building at a grassroots level, whether it be the last mile, the panchayats, the districts, the state or the center, and all of them must work hand in hand for sure. The release of carbon, release of greenhouse gases, emissions is a way of concern and we must ensure that we contain this. I do not want to give statistics because all of us know that, but then the mitigation to avert a ton of greenhouse gases, namely the cost per ton of carbon averted, which the economists use to compare the expense of different carbon reduction strategies. I mean, we need to be conscious of this. And in the United States, according to data from the rhodium groups, it's almost coming to $3,200 to $5,400 per ton of carbon to mitigate it. European Union apparently is more or less the same amount. So the COVID-19 induced shutdown is reducing emissions at a cost of between 32 and 54 times the $100 per ton that economy is considerable a reasonable price. I think the loss of life and economic misery during this pandemic is on par with what will happen regularly if we do not eliminate the effects of climate change. I think countries across the world must develop for risk preparedness, reasonable differences of climate vulnerability, the existence of health systems and the social safety nets, and of course the outbreak trajectory. The government multilateral institutions are all come together and the intersection of the pandemic with the climate change must recognize before we come with interventions and the guidance to unique vulnerabilities. A long-term strategy has to be developed. COVID is neither the first, like I said, or the last time that our globalized society will face these types of compound risks. I think the 
spatial and temporal coincidence of physical hazards or socio-economic risk factors, interdependencies between sectors, namely food to energy to water to health and excess must be understood fully well. I think achievement of universal health coverage by 2030 is critical to reduce health system vulnerability and to minimize long-term health impacts of climate attributable events. I think proactive climate resilience measures for climate change adaptation and pandemic preparedness must be framed as part of every country's legal obligation to realize the right to health through the laws, policies, and of course, the budgets. If you really look at it, laws of habitat forces animals to mitigate and potential contact with other animals or people and share the germs. Large livestock farms can also serve as a source for spillover of infections from animals to people less demand for animal meat and more sustainable animal husbandry could decrease emerging infectious diseases risk and lower greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions as well. I think the economic picture attributable to climate change is also very stark. The range of likely impacts from climate change and from COVID varies quite a bit depending upon which economic models we use. But it's very clear that the conclusion is unmistakable. In the next decade or two, economic damage caused by climate change will likely be as bad as having COVID-sized pandemic every 10 years. At the end of the century, it will be much worse if the world remains on its current emissions path. I think we all need to be conscious and ensure that we understand this. India has to very clearly be economically strong and ecologically sensitive to achieve the $5 trillion economy. Our diversity of natural assets offers immense potential for employment in the fields of ecological sustainability and of course the natural capital economy, particularly in adaptation and mitigation for a net zero restoration economy. We have 140 million hectare restoration potential to create jobs in forest and agroforestry biodiversity, friendly agriculture to bring in communities on board. I think Manrega, through the investment of $4 billion, can create 8 to 10 million jobs in forest restoration, protection, management, agroforestry, urban greening, sustainable timber, and watershed rehabilitation. Renewable energy sector is another one where a full transition to renewables will create 3 million jobs by 2030. Coupled with the flexible microgrid, we can drive rural entrepreneurship in the solar industry for hard to reach communities. Effective management systems need to be done. And with the use of AI, machine learning and blockchain, we can also drive, drive efficiency across infrastructure, agriculture, waste, water and natural resource management. I think India must shift the green economy and in the renewable energy sector itself, we can add additional 3 million jobs by 2030 as per the International Labour Organization. The role of young people is very critical in the field of climate change. One obvious route is making career in this field in terms of the kind of job. This could be field-related job in which candidates work with the communities for either mitigation action or adaptation actions. This could be with a think tank or research community where analytical skills are required or could be advocacy kind of job where candidates become part of institutions and efforts that demand accountability and fast action from governments and big corporations for addressing the issue of climate change and ecological sustainability. 
We all, as guardians of the civil society, must be conscious of the impact of our work on the nation's progress. We have to align our personal aspirations with the needs of the organizations and needs of the nation, more importantly, preserving nature at the center of, center of every activity we do. I think we need to be the change and make the change happen in Mahatma Gandhi's famous words. Thank you and all the best for the Eastern Himalayas 8th edition of the forum. All the very best. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Manoj, for joining us at the 8th Eastern Himalayan Naturonomics Forum on the topic of ecology is economy. Uh, we're glad to have you with us and we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts uh, based on your ex extensive experience with Blenheim Chalkut and doing um, a lot of work in venture building over the years. So I think let's start with a very basic and fundamental question. How relevant is the idea of ecology is economy today? Well, look, firstly, Joanna, I want to congratulate you and um, uh, and all of your colleagues at the Valley Power Foundation for uh, putting on this, uh, um, this program and this conference and this event, because fundamentally, because it's something, um, you know, which, uh, you know, my great friend Ranjit has, uh, uh, has talked about for as long as I've known him, which is nearly 30 years. Um, and yet it's something really that, if I'm really honest, I've only taken a, um, a, an interest in in the last four or five years. And I think therein lies the answer to your question, which is the truth is that the focus on natural capital, the focus on the environment, the focus on climate change, the focus on ecology, um, hasn't really entered the mainstream consciousness in uh, until really the last five years. Um, and the reason I think this is so important for business right now is because it's, it's, it's probably the number one issue that's on the minds of young people. It's the number one issue that we, um, as, a, as a contributor to many of the negative causes uh, of the negative impact on the environment that we have, have to address. Um, and it's probably now becoming, hopefully, uh, with perhaps some of the political changes that we've seen in the last couple of weeks, becoming the number one issue for government. So, um, so it's never been more important and it's important for business to realize that because if you don't, you won't win the hearts and minds of your people, you won't win the hearts and minds of your investors, um, and fundamentally, you won't be building sustainable businesses. So building up what you're talking about here, I think uh, let's talk a little bit about employment. So the World Economic Forum this year has put out several reports discussing uh, the opportunities that exist in building a more sustainable economy. And they're projecting a dollar 10 trillion opportunity through adaptation and mitigation for greater ecological efficiency globally. So how do we tap into the opportunities in these, uh, let's call them sunrise industries in the sustainability sector, whether we're looking at forestry or renewables or sustainable land and ocean use, infrastructure efficiency, I think one of the things I sincerely hope that coronavirus uh, accelerates is the awareness of the importance of addressing the climate uh, and environmental issues. I mean, something like, um, you know, uh, $9 billion of investment it could help reduce deforestation, which in turn will lower uh, zoonotic disease risk by over 40%. Now, when you, when you think about that, uh, a statement like that, the linkage between the environment and something like coronavirus that's sort of destroyed the economy, that's not a linkage that people have necessarily made yet. And that's something that we have to make. And once we make that argument, then you will see everyone, uh, I think, take a different perspective on the environment. And the other consequence of coronavirus is going to be a once in a generational shift in uh, employment patterns. Uh, and employment demand and like it or not 
around the world over the next two to three years, we're going to be faced with um, double digit employment, uh, sorry, unemployment um, in a way that we haven't been since the probably the depression of the 1930s. And so governments, businesses, individuals have to ask questions like, where are those new, where is that new employment going to come from? And what reskilling do I have to undertake to go and access that new employment? Right now, digital companies are making that argument very clearly. Technology companies are making that argument very, very clearly. But actually, um, what we also have to do is encourage um, uh, the renewable energy industry, the sustainable energy industry, the environmental industry to win that argument as well, because that economy and that economy that's going to grow out of um, what the governments and businesses are going to get focused on is a fantastic source of new demand for the unemployment that the world's going to be faced with. To bring it closer to home and answer your question about the Eastern Himalayas, I think there's a really interesting opportunity to make East, the Eastern Himalayas um, the economy of the future. So we've talked about it at various events before as it being an exemplar for biodiversity and an exemplar for um, uh, how to deal with the environment. But actually, I've never th thought that's going to win the argument. What I think can win the argument is if you can make the Eastern Himalayas uh, and the regions they're in exemplars of a modern economy and a modern economy with full employment, but full employment from new sunrise industries. And then to answer your sub question of how do you uh, how do you um, catalyze that? I think government incentives can play a huge role. But if I were a regional government, a state government, uh, you know, or a city government or a national government, right now, I would be most interested in incentives and fiscal policy that drives employment. And if renew, if if you win the argument that which which is an easy argument to win, that renewable industries and the environment generate those jobs. We have to get government to see that opportunity, government to provide some of the incentives, and business will always act in the way that incentives are structured. Get the incentives right, businesses follow. So imagine if we could convince the Assamese government to say, let's make Guwahati the city of the future. And I think we have to say, how do we build the most environmental friendly economy but not in a way where we can say it's environmentally friendly, but where we can say this economy is now one of the richest economies and one of the most successful economies and one of the fast growth economies. So what do you think this economy would look like for the Eastern Himalayas or Assam specifically? I think we need to change the paradigm from you know, doing good to creating economic wealth, right? Because bluntly, it's only then that people sit up and take notice. And whatever the framework is that you choose or that you buy into for how you build regionally competitive economies. I mean, you know, I personally quite like, you know, the Mike Porter diamond theory of, you know, developing clusters, right? Where you've got the right demand conditions, the right support industry, the, the right su supply chain and support industries, where you've got the right sort of firm structure and competitiveness and where you've got the right factor conditions and whether it's the diamond or or some other model that you use the question we really have to ask is how do you build competitiveness into an economy and one of the ways you build a competitiveness is building really strong clusters of uh, renewable energy industries of sustainable industries of environmentally focused industries because that's where the growth is going to be so then if you unpack that and you say well what do we need well we need the right you know government conditions whether that's incentives uh, or, or, or you know for, you know relating to investment we need the right factor conditions one of the biggest constraints and one of the biggest accelerators of a cluster is the education infrastructure that exists in a region. So we have to ask ourselves the question, have we got the best educational programs? Are we producing the right talent to support uh, renewable and sustainable industries? And if you get those two things right from the governmental and from the infrastructural perspective, 
then companies will naturally be attracted. If companies are attracted, you get competition, you get the rivalry that drives that competitiveness and you get, you know, clusters of, of businesses co-locating. And if, if you get that right, you build um, demand conditions uh, for employment, demand conditions um, that drive economic growth. And so it becomes less a conversation about environmental friendliness and more a conversation about how do we build regional economies. And right now, if I was advising a government on which two sunrise industries or which industries to build competitive clusters in, top of the list has to be digital. Equal top of the list has to be the environment. Thank you very much, Manoj, for joining us today. And thank you for sharing your thoughts on this. Uh, it was our pleasure to have you with us. And we hope you will join us for future sessions. Likewise. Okay.